You can give to the poor and that's good, but it won't get you into heaven. You can be baptized in water, but it won't get you into heaven. You can be baptized until the frogs know you by first name, but you won't get into heaven. None of that's going to get... How do you get in there? You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That means a wholehearted belief in Jesus. Amen. Amen. This morning, I'd like to speak to you on the topic of what shall it profit a man? What shall it profit a man? Questions, urgent questions that the Bible asks that all of us will have to answer. We will all have to answer these questions. Turn with us to Mark chapter 8. I'm going to be reading in Mark chapter 8, a text from verse 34 through 37. Verse 34 through 37. Verse 34 says, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and for the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? We have so many choices. We have big choices, little choices. We have big choices every day. We say, well, what am I going to wear to work today? That's normally not a big choice. Or we say, you know, am I going to, uh, to go here or am I going to go there? But there are other choices that are much more important. You may say, well, I'm going to get a job right out of high school, and that's a good thing. Or you may say, I'm going to go to college. That can change the direction of your entire life. It can. We all make choices. We all have decisions, and we all face questions. One of the first questions we find in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. Adam, God asked Adam a question. He says, Adam, where are you? God knew where he was. God knew the answer to the question. But he said, Adam, where are you? And Adam was there and he was hiding in the bushes because he was afraid because sin had come and brought fear into his heart and into his life, and the fear had, had pulled him back. God was asking Adam a question. He was saying, Adam, are you ready for full fellowship with God? Has your relationship with God been broken by sin? Are you on the Lord's side? Have you been seduced by sin and by Satan? God is asking all of us the same thing. And then in Genesis chapter 4, verse 9, God asks another question. He says, where is your brother Abel? God knew the answer to that. He knew it very well. He said, the voice of your brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Innocent blood has an audible voice speaks into the ear of God. Every child that is aborted 
the blood of that child cries out to God and says, Oh God, hear me, the innocent who were murdered. Every single one, every murderer will hear the cry for all eternity from that blood and the blood of innocent children. And America, I believe, will be under the judgment of God for the blood of innocent children. What about Job? Did Job have a question? Job had a question. He said, Job 14, 14, he said, if a man die, shall he live again? And Jesus answered and said, because I live, ye shall live also. What an answer. He said, I am the resurrection. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the hope. I am, I am. Job understood very well. And he said, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in my flesh I shall stand upon my feet and I shall see my Redeemer. What an answer. Then there's the Philippian jailer. He says, what must I do to be saved? He said that to Paul and Silas. Did Paul say, go down, find a church, and join it? You'll be saved. No, he didn't. He didn't say anything about joining a church. If I could get everybody saved by joining a church, we'd have constant membership drives and we would be pushing for everybody to join the church. But it doesn't happen. And it won't save you. It will not save you. He said, you, anybody remember the, the Wizard of Oz? The guy was at the Tin Man who wanted to do good deeds. And the, and the wizard said, uh, you'll be a uh, good deed doer. And you can have this certificate that says you do good deeds. And the tin man was so proud. But good deeds won't get you into heaven. Church membership won't get you into heaven. You can give to the poor and that's good. But it won't get you into heaven. You can be baptized in water. But it won't get you into heaven. You can be baptized until the frogs know you by first name, but you won't get into heaven. None of that's going to get... How do you get in there? You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That means a wholehearted belief in Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. You believe. You receive him as your Lord and your Savior and your Master, and you give your life unto him. Well, what's the greatest question of all of them? I read it to you this morning in the book of Mark. He also asked it in Matthew and other Gospels. He says, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Hmm. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What, what kind of a question is that? Hebrews says it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. We know that. I was very close to my grandparents on both sides. They're all dead. My dad died last year on upward day. My mom is still here. She can't be here this morning. But one thing I know, it is appointed unto man for all of us to die, regardless of who you are, where you come from, it is appointed unto man once to die. There's a day of judgment. The issue is not going to be your social standing. It's not going to be your country club that you were a member of. It's not going to be your financial achievements. It's not going to be your professional standing and accomplishments or the size of your house. The question you're going to be asked is, what did I do with Jesus? What did I do 
with Jesus. And that answer, and that answer alone will determine your eternal destiny. What did I do with Jesus? Pilate faced it. Pilate, Pilate said, I don't want to deal with this. He said, oh, and then he heard Galilee. He said, oh, you're from Galilee. Okay, I'm sending you to see Herod. Ha, he sent him off to Herod. He said, I got rid of him. And here he comes back. He says, didn't I send him up to Herod? What's he doing back down here? And he, he, he scourges him. And, he's, and he says, okay, is that good enough? And they call, crucify him. Pilate says, my goodness, I can't get rid of the man. And he washes his hands in a basin. And he says, you take him, you crucify him. I'm out of this. But you see, Pilate was trying to get out of answering the question. But he could not. Jesus kept coming back. He kept coming back. He washed his hands like Shakespeare's play. The man constantly washing his hands. He says, I'm washing my hands of this matter. But he could not. And history tells us that Pilate was banished and later hung himself because of the decision that he made with Jesus. Thirdly, this question is vital. Because your soul is immortal. Because your soul is immortal. You know, there's been a day when you were not. It's a day when I was not. You know, when Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, 1492. I went to school. I know these things. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. I wasn't here. I didn't exist. I was not anywhere around. And George Washington was at Valley Forge in Yorktown. I wasn't there. I, I wasn't even thought of then. In the Civil War at Gettysburg, the Battle of Little Round Top, I would love to have been there to see it. But I wasn't. None of us were. But did you know that there will never, ever be another day that you are not in existence? You are going to be in existence forever. Amen. You're going to be here. The only question is, where? Am I going to be in heaven or am I going to be in the lake of fire? That's the, and that question depends, the answer to that question will determine your eternal destiny. It will determine your eternal destiny. How you respond to that question will make all the difference in the world for you. You're created in the image of God. Three in one, spirit, soul, and body. You're made in His image. You're eternal. Some say, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's eternal life with Jesus in heaven. But all of us are eternal, and we're all going to be somewhere. This makes this the most important question in the world. Well, this is a question only Jesus could answer. It is. It's only he could answer this because Jesus knows all of the wealth of this world. He does. He knows where every diamond mind is. Man, what if you knew all that? <laughs> he knows where every diamond mine. He knows where every gold mine. He knows where all the silver is. He knows where the oil reserves are that will make a man a billionaire overnight. He knows where they all are. He knows every one of these. He knows, he knows the unknown treasures. Jesus has weighed in the scales. He's weighed it. He's looked at it. And Jesus said the man who would trade his soul 
for all the wealth of the world is the prince of fools. He is the prince of fools. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You can know the answer. You can make it. Well, Jesus alone knows the value of your soul. He does. He knows the value of your soul. Your soul brought Jesus down. Do you see? Jesus created all things in Colossians chapter 1. I think it's verse 16 and 17. It says, by him, for him, through him were all things made. And through Christ all things consist. He holds it all together. In John chapter 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word came and became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld Him as the only begotten of the Father. He is the Creator. It says He created the world. And he was in the world, and the world didn't know him. That's what John says. He was in the world, and the world didn't know him. Jesus' whole life was a descent. He descended from the portals of glory. He became a man. He was born in Bethlehem. He was born in a manger. When he was in the carpenter shop, and he tripped, he didn't float. Woo. He fell down. He cut his hand. He was exhausted. He bled. He was a man. And it brought Jesus. And then Jesus was mocked. Can you see it? He was mocked. In the Antonio Fortress there in Jerusalem, there's still the pavement with the markings on it where they, they played games with Jesus, where they beat him and mocked him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They beat his back and whipped it unmercifully. And then they nailed him to a cross. Why? Why did Jesus go through such pain and agony and horror? Because he knows the value of your soul. He knows the value of your heart and your soul and your life. And he loves you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It drove him to weep in Gethsemane. Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus told the parable of the lost sheep. I don't have time to recount it for you. The sheep are basically Stupid and defenseless. They get lost not because of something they've done, but because of their careless meandering. They were pretty easy prey for an enemy. They would bleed, and the wolf would say, Oh, there's a dinner bell. I hear it. A sheep is lost. He's wandered away. He's all by himself. It's dinner time. Jesus said, leave the 99 and go look for the one lost sheep. He said, go search through the night, through the storm. Search for the one lost sheep who is lost and undone and bring him back. That is the reason that the church exists to win the lost, to carry them and show them the good news of Jesus. Winning the lost is the paramount mission of the church. It's why we exist. It's our purpose for being. He said, go and compel them to come. Go and compel them. Jesus said, he that believeth not is condemned already. He said, I haven't come to condemn the world. The world's already condemned. But I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. Your loved ones, your friends, 
your mothers, your cousins, brothers, maybe sons or daughters that are lost. Don't say, well, one day I hope that they'll come to salvation, but I don't want to run my Uncle Fred away because I don't want to push the gospel. Your Uncle Fred is a drunk. Share the gospel with him. Carry the good news of hope and life and give him the opportunity to come to Jesus. Carry the good news of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amos 6 and 1 says, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. The church is Zion. Are we content to sit on our pews, to sit inside this building, are we content to sit here and say, well, let, let those come on in who need Jesus. No, Jesus said, you go out. You get them. Go into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in with the good news of Jesus Christ. Eva Hart was a survivor on the Titanic. Many of us remember the movie because the movie Titanic that came out 10 or 12 years ago. She was on the Titanic. The Titanic was an awesome ship. If you never read about it, it was the biggest ship that had ever been built. It was the fastest ship that had ever been built. It could cut through the water in 1912 at 25 knots in a luxury. And Bruce Ismay who was the president of the White Star Line, who owned the Titanic. He told the captain, who was, by the way, making his final voyage, about to retire, he told the captain, he said, we've got to set a world record. We've got to cross the Atlantic in record time. Let the whole world know. Don't slow down. Don't change course. On April the 12th, April the 15th, 1912, rather, the Titanic struck an iceberg, ripped a 300-foot hole in its side. Oh, they had warned him. They had warned him 12 times. Slow down. Change course. There's icebergs. But the captain, he didn't know because Bruce Ismay said, keep going keep going. They tore a hole in the side of the ship. And the ship, in two hours and 20 minutes, it sank. Did you know what the newspaper had written? It said the Titanic is the unsinkable ship. Even God can't sink this ship. I would have said, uh, here's my ticket. Here, here's my ticket. Somebody else can go. Eva Hart said that the lifeboats, there were 20 lifeboats, just 20, and many of them only had 10 and 12 people in it, first-class passengers who rowed away. And all the others, 1,562, went into the water. At the Senate hearings, Eva Hart testified. She said, we wanted to go back. But the men, the crewmen and the lifeboats wouldn't go back. We could hear the people yelling. We could hear them calling to us. We could hear them crying and yelling and calling. But they wouldn't go back. They said that all the people would grab a hold of our lifeboat and they would sink it. And it would be better for us to just stay out here where it's safe. Where it's safe out here. She said she has nightmares of all of the cries of the people who died in an hour's time in the frigid North Atlantic. 1,562 people died. Folks, what about us? Are we going to stay safe in our rowboat? Are we going to stay safe? Are we going to say, hey, we can't take a risk. 
we can't take a chance. Or are we going to go back to rescue the perishing, rescue the dying, call unto them? Fourthly, and very quickly, I bring it to a close. Alexander the Great died at 33 years of age. He sat, he sat there on his he sat there on his step and he cried because there were no more worlds to conquer. What a what a crazy thing. He cried because he had conquered the world. And in a few months, he died. Remember the rich man built his barns? He said, I'll build bigger barns. I'll build bigger warehouses. I'll set it all up. I'll say, Lord, I'm going to just eat, drink, and be merry, and say to my soul, take your ease. What did God say? Thou fool, this night. Thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall these things be? Whose shall these things be? We come to the end. What's the answer to this question? What's the answer? Is it heaven or hell? Heaven, enter thou into the joys of the Lord forever. Or is it hell? Revelations 20, 15 says, Whosoever's name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. What, are, what is it going to be for you? You say, oh, pastor, don't talk about hell and the lake of fire. That, that's, that's old Nobody talks about that anymore. Well, I want to tell you, Jesus talked more about it than he did about heaven. He talked more about it than anybody else in the Bible. He apparently believed it. The Apostle Paul wrote about it. He believed it. Hell is real whether you believe it or not. Fire is real and it will burn whether you believe it or not. Gravity is real whether you believe it or not. The lake of fire is a real place where you will live forever and ever in torment or you can turn to God and you can live in heaven in a great work environment working for God and for His kingdom.